Namaskara, good evening, and welcome to today's BIC Streams session, A History Forgotten in India, The Legacy of Patrick Geddes. Patrick Geddes was a Scottish polymath whose contributions covered the fields of biology, sociology, geography, ecology, civics, and urban planning. He has been called the father of modern town planning and was ahead of his time on issues such as ecology, heritage, preservation, and the sociology of cities. Today's discussion featuring historians Narayani Gupta and Partho Datta, architect, urban planner, and conservation consultant, A.G. Krishna Menon, will explore the value of the legacy that Giddies offers us, speculate on what the Indian city might have been if our urban planning was based on this legacy and reflect on how we might restore lessons from Patrick Geddes within contemporary discourse on India's cities and towns. This session is conceived and moderated by architect, writer, and philosopher, Prem Chandavakar. Um, the bios of all the speakers will appear on your chat box, which is on the bottom of the Zoom screen. And through the session, if you have questions, observations, or comments to share, please feel free to use the Q&A box next to the chat box, also at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, with that, I hand it over to Prem. Thank you, Lekha. Uh, this seminal figure, Patrick Geddes, uh, who's called the father of modern urban planning and uh, who had a very different approach to what we see as urban planning today. He, he rejected abstract ideas such as the grid plan and advocated an approach he called conservative surgery, which was based on careful diagnostic surveys of every city to understand its specific history, culture, spatial pattern, physical form, topography, and ecology. India was fortunate to receive his dedicated attention. In the decade from 1914 to 1924, he spent most of his time here, authored close to 50 town plans, some lengthy in more than one volume, and some of just a few pages. He was the first head of the sociology department at Bombay University from 1919 to 1924. Yet he is largely forgotten in India. And if we look for ideas in urban planning, we tend to look elsewhere. What exactly was his legacy and how well served would we be to re-examine it today? These are questions we will look at today. Uh, we will first start with uh, uh, the three presentations, starting with uh, Narayani Gupta, followed by Partha Datta and H.K. Menon. Uh, then we'll have a moderated discussion between our panelists and we will end with an open Q&A session. So with that, I now request uh, Narani Gupta to make her presentation. Thank you so much for him. And thank you, Ravi, for inviting me to join this discussion. <clears throat> I was just, um, I'm going to just go over a few things that always uh, strike, come to mind when I think of Patrick Gaddis. Um One is that, um, he lived 78 years, but after that, for 50 years, right up till 2004, there were archivists working to collect and index and sort out his papers. He, he's still very much alive in his uh, archives, but also, and I hope you all have a chance to enjoy this, also in the city of Edinburgh. If you go to Edinburgh, you'll find that many people know something or other about him. He's a figure there who's still very much in evidence. You have a stray lamp stand somewhere, a street lamp, or you have some tiny little park, or uh, just the sense of areas being developed, little corners being developed, according to um, his notions of how a city can be enjoyed, how every bit of it can be made into something which the citizens can share. And I think the fact that he is owned by Dilbara is something, in a way I feel almost envious of this, 
We don't have somebody like that whom we can appropriate in India. And maybe the time will come and maybe we will have planners who are not remote, who are not people whom we don't fully understand and whom we can interact with. I myself um, met Geddes in 1973, met in the sense of knowing about him, when Helen Miller, who's written an extremely fine biography of him, came to India retracing his journeys. Later, I had an opportunity to see his collections and was made to feel welcome. The atmosphere was not that of an impersonal archives, but that of a family home. Everybody had something to say about him, talk about him, laugh about him. Patrick Geddes, affable, eager, loquacious, lived on well beyond his death. In 1981, I remember stumbling over chaotic files of papers at the you know, Edinburgh University. In 1988, when I went again briefly, I read files of the National Library in Edinburgh. In 2004, I was proudly handed six massive volumes of checklists of thousands of documents, which are at Strathclyde University in Glasgow. So there is no dearth of material. And each time I was stupefied by the sheer quantity and the range that came across. His eagerness, his openness, his living every moment, ruminating on the past, observing the present, and also making plans for the future. That is his greatness. Geddes never stopped growing. He had no university degree, but he's claimed by at least half a dozen disciplines. He's a lifelong student and teacher. He was what you could call in a very cliche term, a Renaissance man. And all his interests have not been studied any more than those of Leonardo da Vinci. He urged synthesis and he always found transference useful. In biology, the first subject he studied somewhat formally, he met the word ecology. It was a relatively new word at the time. This he transferred to town and regional planning. His biosocial science, which included the study of slums firsthand, firsthand means he went and actually lived in the slums in order to experience them. These built on the work of Herbert Spencer, Improvement in social progress, he said, would only come about if the local residents were the major agents of change. Through these projects, as Renwick points out, uh, Geddes was able to hone his biosocial ideas and methods in such a way that by the end of the 1890s, he was actively promoting them as a model of sociological inquiry and therefore as the culmination of the reforms of social science that he'd been working on. His range in discourse and activity, the two go side by side, was possible only by being as undisciplined as he was. Most scholars today are too firmly trapped in isms and ologies to be able to break out of them. Geddes's friend, Jagdish Chandra Bose, whose biography he wrote incidentally, told him, the very fact of your versatile intellect has made it hopeless for anybody to see the thing as a whole. What the public wants is a thread that they can follow. So I think for us, the first task would be to try and tease out these threads to make him intelligible to others. There's a curious mismatch. His practical suggestions for action had not been drawn upon, but there is a veritable industry worrying away at his philosophies. Think global, act local has become such a familiar slogan that we forget it was Geddes who first coined it. It's exhilarating to think globally and loftily, oh yes, but to act locally, now that is a challenge. The most frequently used label for him, as uh, the previous speakers have said, is theorist of town planning. And that actually was the flavor of the age from the 1890s. Town planning was being discussed at international fora. This is the age of cities, Geddes announced in 1904. From 1910, he was identified with his traveling exhibition, Cities and Town Planning. In 1915, he published Cities in Evolution, 
which is one of the great books of history. And uh, it has its own history, which I don't have time to go into, of how it was modified subsequently. His iconic Outlook Tower, which you will see in Edinburgh, was vastly popular, but it's now become a tourist attraction rather than the research tool that it was. The 1910s, what a crowded time that was between plague and the Spanish flu, the vigorous concern to make cities healthier, to devise rapid transport so that uh, the rich could retreat to the suburbs, a new concept, to celebrate imperial and nationalist confidence through cities beautiful, Bauhaus, a metaphor for building economically, but also with the controlled aesthetic of the classroom. Meanwhile, in India, improvement trusts, this Parthu will be referring to, were giving piecemeal relief to crowded cities. New capital cities were being designed, New Delhi and others for the rulers, for the, the princes and their states. In India in the 1910s also, ideas and journeys crisscrossed. We know where most of these people, I don't have to list them, the Kumaraswamis and other uh, people who uh, were empathetic cultural explorers who studied the arts and developed departments of scientific inquiry. One person other than Geddes I'd like to mention is uh, the young archeologist Gordon Sanderson. He was looking for the Indian quote unquote architect as distinct from the draftsman in the context of the planning of New Delhi. The other was Geddes, eager to identify Indian town plan. In 1915, Sanderson was killed in the, uh, when soon after he'd enlisted for the First World War. He was not even 30 years old. In 1915, the same year, Geddes, who was now 60, came to India to begin a new life. As always, he was both student and mentor. He had much to observe and understand. Indian towns behaved differently from any he knew, but yet they were oddly familiar. The Scotsman in him, I like to think, appreciated the sympathy between contours and the forms of the town, the informality of public spaces. He wanted to understand whether there were indigenous mechanical and hydraulic engineering principles which had guided the building of such congenial settlements, whether the informal spaces had been created or had just happened, whether like Petruccioli was to say much later, disorder is order that we do not understand. He launched on a record-breaking series of first-hand surveys of nearly 50 towns, answered zillions of letters from people. I mean, I've seen these little postcards to him asking him for advice, it was truly extraordinary. It's been much more than I think any Indian planner has done. Many of his reports have not been revisited. Some are not available. Pakistan acknowledged him hand, uh, handsomely when they published their master plan of Lahore. They put his report on Lahore as an epigraph. Annie uh, Besant had Heard, uh, urged him to visit temples at Kanchipuram. But he saw them, this is interesting, not in terms of architecture as other people did, but as a trigger to urbanism. And uh, he wrote, at once coined the term, which we now use freely, temple cities. That term led him to question the question of town building. He was curious about the guiding principles. And he found that there were manuals which had been classified as Sanskrit texts. After all, it is the Shilpa Shastra, the Vastu Shastra. There is a kind of sanctity to them, which um, Alberti or others in the West would not have had. Uh, later, many others have come to light in Indian languages. Just as the European Renaissance brought classical texts into circulation by translation, the 1920s Indian Renaissance brought these Sanskrit and Tamil texts into circulation. There were other scholars who wrote little books dedicated to Patrick Gates. 
they were nourished by his enthusiasm. But after a brief session of the fun, they went back to the shelves, perfumed with neem leaves and forgotten. India has no use. The Shastras have been vulgarized into what's called Vastu. This can be discussed further. Um, years later in 2005, at an exhibition organized by the uh, Delhi Urban Art Commission, an overwhelming, disconcerting majority of visitors chose a picture of modern Shanghai over one of a stone wall with a channel of water and overhanging flowering trees as the ideal for Delhi. Where an older town is adjacent to a planned civil station or a cantonment, the latter is assumed to point the view forward. And the Indian can sink into uh, oblivion. And as though it's a day, it has uh, become irrelevant. Geddes, this is now moving away from the towns, he had not been an academic, but he dreamed of the university. Of, he was a teacher only. And he got the opportunity. He wrote extensively on Adayar in Madras, Osmania in Hyderabad, Vishwabharati in Shantiniketan, and Jerusalem. But as he pushed ahead, the others drew back. Rabindranath Tagore in 1922 was quite alarmed. Uh, it was, he says, with a bewilderment of admiration that I followed the architectural immensity of your vision, vision. but it was beyond my power to make a practical use of them. All my activities have the character of play in them. Your own schemes have a different idiom. So though they remained friends, they did not work together. This was the same with academic departments. He was the first head of the sociology department, the second department of sociology in Asia. Uh, and he gave it his own touch by calling it sociology and civics. And I think it's important to remember this. Its curriculum did not go down very well with everyone. And in 1923, uh, Mr. Wadia and Bombay did not mince words. The great professors absorbed in town planning and verbiage about biotechnology and ethno polity. He said there was obviously a tremendous sort of clash of interests or what they thought should be given priority. Uh, later, to do them justice, the faculty members did admit that he had been treated somewhat unfairly. So maybe this is something also that should be looked into and thought about. But to me, what comes out from this is that Geddes never let failures make him bitter or cynical. He shrugged and moved on. He disliked the ruthlessness of Hausman. He was not hostile to building capital, great capitals, though. He recommended himself when names were um, asked, for, when people were asked to suggest names for the building of New Delhi, he suggested himself. He saw the, um, sorry, um, we miss him today when the indignation over the uh, Central Vista has had many competent experts commenting on them, but no one so far with the wisdom of Gates to stand away and to see it in perspective and its implications, not just for the Central Vista, but for our urban future. One term, by the way, that one misses in Geddes's writings, unless I have just that I have not noticed it, is heritage. Heritage was coming into use then, and there were many different interpretations, aspects of it to study. To him, the past consisted of many landscapes that should be part of the larger townscape by conservative surgery when necessary, but not through mindless reverence. He would have been alarmed at the scale at which urban areas are being treated as real estate. The Central Vista is only one. There are the tribal lands. There is the recent uh, issue of Lakshadri. Would he have worked out perhaps how his concept of regional survey could be used to counter arbitrary land grab? Get his passed away just before Hitler's coup of 1933. 
the coming of the war, the destruction of towns. Architects and planners would soon went up their hands full with reconstruction, with new housing projects. And just as the Madras governor had invited Geddes 30 years earlier, independent India now invited architects to build their cities for them. He would have loved to have been there. The Chandigarh plan, not of Corbusier, who was the second choice, but that of planners were one nuance, not of binaries as black and white. I think I'll stop there now and suggest that we take on the story of the history of town planning in a different fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Narayani. Uh, now, if I can request Partho Datta to yeah, make his Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Prem, and to Ravi uh, for to make this presentation. Uh, quickly, so uh, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, over the years I noticed and all of us have, can see there is a new affinity to Geddes, which is growing. All kinds of people now find a kind of connection to him. One thing that was pointed out to me, and I didn't know myself about it very much by another scholar some time ago, that he's also seen as the, not only as the father of the town planning, but also the father of the internet. And Timothy Berners-Lee uh, uh, apparently quotes very approvingly of his correspondence that Paul Outlet and Geddes actually, uh, you know, had, had these letters uh, which they wrote to each other. So there is that connection of Geddes also, which I find fascinating and it would be wonderful to know, you know, how it all connects to his views on uh, cities and towns and plans. Now, two, uh, the thing that is most, uh, the overwhelming question, which I, when, the, when I was asked to speak here is I kept on wondering what would Geddes have made of the Central Vista? What's happening now? I mean, that is something, uh, frankly, I don't know. I really don't know. But I was looking at his reports and two things come repeatedly again and again. One is that uh, Geddes uh, was very wary of the state, always, always. He was very wary. But what comes up across even more strongly is how wary he is of architects and planners. And he actually cautioned uh, about, I think this is what the implications of his writings are. He always cautioned uh, about a pact between the two. So uh, anyway, I'll just leave it to there. Maybe we can have a discussion on that. Now I'm going to approach uh, Geddes uh, as a, uh, from, the, as from a perspective of a historian, historian of town planning. And I just want to uh, do two things very briefly. Uh, one is I'll contextualize uh, uh, Geddes, uh, his work in uh, India very, very briefly. And if there is time, maybe I'll just very also briefly talk about one of his plans uh, because it was slightly different from the others, which is his plan for Calcutta. Now, uh, when Geddes started working in, uh, in India, uh, there were, two models of planning which were in uh, which were uh, uh, which were being implemented and actually they were implemented all over the world there were universal models one was the model of intervening in the city um, and this of course you could see in the work of the improvement trusts, trusts in the early 20th century late 19th early 20th century the spectacular examples are bombay improvement trust calcutta improvement trust the other was uh, that you escape the city. You can't solve problems within this older traditional cities. You build a new, you, build, you go to another, an empty plane and you build there. And the, that was happening in New Delhi, where a whole new so-called township was coming up. What's interesting is that Geddes had his feet in both these areas. Uh, he, he actually engaged with both of them and he offered some kinds of solutions. One for the one where you intervene in the city, he offered what he called conservative surgery, which Prem actually mentioned and Ran Naranidi also mentioned. And uh, we can discuss this later. I won't go into a definition of it, but I was reading a, a very interesting essay by a, a historian uh, who's written a book on Patrick Geddes and she's in the University of Jerusalem, Noah uh, uh, Rubin. And she, the way she defines uh, conservative surgery is that it was, an, it was about compatibility. Are traditional materials compatible with uh, contemporary concerns? That is what he meant by conservative surgery. I just leave it there. His other model, which is where you build a new, uh, he obviously uh, rejected the large scale plan. And what he really wanted to do was he wanted to build 
a smaller manageable uh, uh, townships, uh, suburbs, if you would like to call them, as Narayaniji mentioned. And these were to be underwritten by two things. One would be a new, uh, a new model of sewage, which is through sewage farms. So these would be environmentally viable. And the other thing was, of course, the connection with nature. Uh, you know, these would be green spaces. And this obviously had come from the Garden Cities movement, which uh, Geddes was very much uh, uh, sort of connected with. Now, uh, uh, so that gives a very brief uh, introduction to uh, the background to uh, Geddes. Now, what happens is that uh, we know that people engage with Geddes' work and they feel excited about him and architects and planners do, but when they actually start reading him, uh, they uh, feel disappointed. I think one of the reasons why Geddes has actually fallen off the map is precisely because of this. And what is it? Because they feel that Geddes really has nothing to say about the big metropolis. If you look at his uh, plans for, uh, uh, for India, they're all about princely capital, suburbs, district headquarters, and so on and so forth. Uh, land owning, uh, uh, you know, the gentry who own land and you know what he could do with them. So where is the big city? I mean, it's just, uh, it is just not there at all. It's, it's this. Um, so his reputation therefore has suffered. Although people celebrate him, they actually don't find him very interesting after a point. Now, uh, when he came to Calcutta, uh, he was asked to do a report of one district of Kolkata, which is called Boro Bajar or Bada Bazar, uh, which was the uh, uh, business center of Kolkata. And uh, I'm going to suggest, and this is my interpretation of it, that here Geddes really had to grapple with what is the big city, although it was not about all of Calcutta, but just about one district there. And the two things that he had to confront with were absolutely germane to planning or to the, uh, to the generation of modern planning, let me say. One was, how do you repurpose the city for modern business? That is uh, for capital. That is the most important. So the functional plan, what we call modern planning actually is nothing but the way to make the city much more economically viable. That's one thing. The other is the flip side of it, which is that wherever you have modern business and wherever you have capitalism, you have the working class, which is the bane of, the, uh, of capitalism. How do you regulate them? Because they will have to stay in the city or its whereabouts. So uh, these were two, two things that you have to confront and which all modern planners, all modern planners who confront the modern city actually have to confront with. So uh, what uh, happened in Borobajar and when Geddes came to this, uh, what did he actually find? The history of uh, intervention in Kolkata and this particular district called Barabajar is fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is because Geddes had to confront this. One was that in the 1890s, there was a plan afoot to raise this entire district. Can you, it's unbelievable, but they actually said it. They said, let's just raise it to the ground. This is a festering sore, it's slummy. And, we, and build the railway station here instead. So the Howrah railway station, which you now see across the city in Kolkata, was supposed to be in the heart of the city. Luckily, I will, if you want, I'll tell you later, it didn't happen. So Bada Baza remained as where it was. The second planning intervention happened uh, after uh, the First World War, although it, the, the CIT, the Calcutta Improvement Trust, actually started working a little before that, from 1914 onwards. Uh, was that they, although it was not exclusively about Borobajar, they sidestepped Borobajar and they built uh, a, a, a thoroughfare, uh, one of the greatest thoroughfares in India and one of the great examples of modern planning, uh, which is called Central Avenue. It's now, it's, it was renamed, it was called Chitranjan Avenue after the great nationalist Chitranjan Das. So it sidestepped Bada Bazaar and the whole idea was that if this new space, modern space was built, then the business classes of Bada Bazaar would migrate to these new modern spaces. And this is exactly what happened. So this was already in the, uh, it was already happening when, uh, when, uh, when uh, Geddes uh, started, uh, was given, given this commission to write on Kolkata, on Bada Bazaar itself. This one thing I would like to say here, a small aside, which is that uh, the second reason why Geddes has fallen out of the map 
uh, uh, which I'd like to say. The reason is that if you read Geddes' reports, and as Narayani Di said, there is very little on architecture. And architects always find him disappointing. You know, so the re and if you look at the writings on Indian architecture, even now, uh, although there are some wonderful books, they are exclusively uh, focused on buildings. We have absolutely no no histories of Indian streets, no histories of neighborhoods or the ecology of neighborhoods, and this is exactly what uh, Geddes's reports uh, focus on again and again and again. Okay. Now, uh, having uh, uh, said this, uh, how did he, uh, what did he uh, uh, focus on in the Bada Bajar report? As I said, he had to confront, he had to uh, uh, confront modern capital and he had to also think about the working classes, the laboring poor. And he, and I'm going to end now, I'm just going to say, I'll give you three of his suggestions and maybe we can discuss this if you want. The first thing uh, that he uh, uh, did was, uh, that he said that let us, uh, instead of having uh, a spate of demolitions, let us make small cuts uh, throughout the uh, neighborhood, the small parks. In fact, uh, uh, another historian who's also written on this, a British historian, uh, Patrick Geddes, uh, called Martin Beatty, has actually calculated the number of small cuts he wanted to make. There were some more than 40 uh, small parks that uh, Geddes envisaged for Bara Bazaar. And Geddes had a theory about them. And the theory was that small open spaces are more likely to survive because these would be community spaces. Whereas the modern open space of the modern planner is actually a sanitary vo void which needs to be policed, right? So it's, the upkeep is very impossible. So if we have small spaces, they will be looked after. That was one thing. The second thing that Geddes suggested that was that we should, we should maintain the ecology of the streets, uh, the lanes of Kolkata. And crucial to his thinking uh, was the form of cities, uh, not architectural form, uh, mind you. Uh, how was the form of city? What did he mean by this? He meant three things uh, by the form of cities, which is it meant he, he was talking about the circulation of people, that is pedestrians, Mostly people walked uh, uh, in this area. Uh, he talked about the circulation of goods because this was a business area. And thirdly, very interestingly, the circulation of ideas. Uh, very crucial to uh, Geddes uh, was in his uh, ideas about the city was uh, uni the university. Uh, again and again, he talks about it. No, sit, no, no uh, uh, big city can really survive without the uh, without the without a university or intellectual life there. Now, uh, of course, the implications of what he was saying about Barabajan meant that he wanted to preserve mixed land use. And he was against zoning. Uh, and not only mixed land use, but also mixed residential use, by, by which he meant that there would be a mix of classes. And behind this thinking, was the idea that uh, if there are uh, that if you demolish or if you persuade the business classes to move away from this center of the of town, then the people who will be hit the hardest will be the laboring poor. Uh, so uh, uh, if you that the uh, that uh, buildings in the heart of the town need to be preserved, the ecology of that neighborhood needs to be preserved. And, and therefore, it will lead to less trauma uh, uh, when it comes to uh, planning for uh, new spaces. Uh, I think I'll just end here. This is just, just his, uh, his ideas about, uh, about, the, about the big city. Thank you, Pato. Uh, we now go to uh, A.G.K. Menon, who I've known for so many years. I tend to refer to him by his nickname, Pogi. So you'll forgive me if use that name. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my talk is a different arc. I think we have had two fascinating discussions on Geddes. I will be looking at Geddes as a town planner, as an architect town planner, practicing. So I call it modernizing historic cities, the relevance of Patrick Geddes. To begin with, uh, 
Students of architecture in India are routinely introduced to the ideas of Patrick Geddes as part of the standard curriculum in the subject of town planning. Many go on to become town planners. And in fact, most town planners in India are graduate architects. Therefore, most professionals in India, architects and urban planners, would have acquired the ideas he uh, uh, propagated, including strategic tools that we discussed, like like diagnostic survey and conservative surgery to deal with the problems of Indian cities. Indeed, many would also have, may have also seen some of the 50 odd reports he made. So in the academy at least, they're taught that to deal with the complexities of, and the uniqueness of Indian urbanism, strategies for intervention must be context specific and not be based on formulaic solutions developed elsewhere. This in a sense was the was Geddes's message. However, in professional practice, they forget Geddes and his message. In fact, they dis display a distinct aversion to it. What they prefer instead is to catch up with the achievements of the counterparts in technologically and economically advanced societies by mimicking, mimicking the models of urban development. In other words, what Geddes advised should be avoided becomes their template for dealing with the problems of Indian cities. This contrariness defines the core of professional ideology and practice. From the academic perspective, of course, it is ironic. But as, as, as we mentioned from a professional perspective, it is doubly ironic because Geddes is, is regarded as the father of Indian town planning. As an architect and urban planner practicing in India, I'm very familiar with these professional, this narrative. His strategies do not respond to the ground realities, but to aspirations and longings for something quite different. As a critic, I'm aware of its failures, of these e egregious ideological propensities. Even education is not equipped with the vision to develop pedagogy to remedy matters. The sociology of the profession has cast it as a marginal government department, as low level functions reason in the bureaucracy, it has limited agency and less incentive to seek reform. For example, it is blind to the obvious, which is that the majority of urban residents in the, uh, consider the city a dystopian city. The majority, I mean, the 50% who are not able to afford the city. This failing was most poignantly foregrounded by the out-migration of poor residents of the cities following the lockdown imposed to contain the COVID-19 pandemic. And perhaps this is catalyzing some kind of rethinking of what Geddes had to say, but that's another story. In most societies, there's an organic link between the old city and the new, which reflects a similar affinity between pre and modern professional objectives of practice. This organic link is manifested in the physical structure of the city. However, tenuous, the relationship between historic and modern developments, the two are largely self-referential entities. For example, the historic parts of European cities and the modern extensions, though they may look different and may also have morphologically, may be morphologically distinguishable, the whole nevertheless is still purposefully integrated, both functionally and in the quality of lives of its residents. Why is such a culture of inclusive and political vision of the city missing in India. In India, there are over 3,000 historic settlements, but in each, the old and the new are distinct entities because they have been treated differently. One is lavished with attention and resources, the other with contempt and neglect. So if I were to understand Geddes, I'd have to begin to understand the origins of this kind of contempt and neglect. The problems of Indian cities are indeed complex, but instead of engaging with it in order to find solutions, the profession has found it expedient to rely on analytical frameworks and strategies developed outside the context. This, in the main, is the crux of the failing of Indian urban planning. To undertake reform, we first need to trace the genesis and evolution of the modern profession in India for understanding its disciplinary underpinnings. The origins of this schism between the old and new urbanism begins with the origins of 
two departments of the government over a century and a half ago, one to construct new buildings and settlements, and the other to preserve the artificial legacy of the country. In July 1854, Lord Dalhousie established the Central Public Works Department, the CPWD, for executing public works undertaken by the government. And in 1861, Alexander Cunningham founded the Archaeological Survey of India to preserve historic buildings. These are two important interventions because over time, the two departments evolved independently, each mediating the nature of the built environment, the CPWD and its cognate affiliates like the uh, city development authorities built the modern city, thus defining the nature of modernity. While the ASI, by valorizing exemplary architectural heritage, inculcated the idea that the past was unchanging and had to be preserved. The separate objectives of these two departments created the debilitating binary in the spatial imagination of our society, which is development versus conservation, to mediate the growth of Indian cities. And this, I think, is again the root of why uh, Geddes is forgotten. Both departments ignored historic settlements. After the experience of 1857, in fact, the historic settlements were regarded as hostile territories that had to be tamed, sanitized, and made safe. Colonial scholars and administrators viewed historic settlements as unchanging and backward, the mirror opposite of the dynamic and industrialized British towns. These views have segued to create the antipathy of the contemporary professional towards indigenous urbanism in general, but historic cities in particular. This perspective was deeply inscribed in the psyche of Indian planners through manuals to facilitate the standardization or an easy dissemination. A typical example of this is the handbook of town planning produced by the public works department of the then Bombay presidency. It categorically states in its contents, this, its contents are based on the British pattern, as though the situation in India was tabula rasa, thus rendering invisible any significance of historic urbanism. The handbook was first published in 1876, and thereafter it was regularly updated. Eight editions were brought out before independence to incorporate the developments taking place in Britain. After independence, the town planning laws based on British laws were put in place, which legally froze the objectives and methods of urban planning and has made it difficult to frame appropriate strategies to meet the planning challenges of contemporary urbanization and economic development. And as a town planner, I found that the difficulty in promoting the ideas of, of Geddes is really this, that the laws will not permit it. And I can get into it as an example later. Colonial, the colonial ideology of urban planning continue to endure in modern society because they're nurtured and nourished by an education system that's put in place after independence. As a perceptive critic has pointed out, the post-colonial education pedagogy draws its inspiration from the colonial period and takes as its model the discipline-based gated community that maintained a distinction between clearly defined groups, administrators, academics, and fee-paying students who could serve as the native vanguards of civilization without reservation and remorse. And this is your town planner native uh, uh, fee-paying student who has become the planner now to civilize the Indian city. This pedagogy continues to valorize theory emanating from the Western academia on the assumption that theory is the product of Western tradition and that the aim of academ acad ac academies and professionals outside the West is to apply it. Such an education system has produced technicians, not urban planners, with holistic, with holistic vision and agendas to deal with the complex problems of Indian urbanization. This mindset has, was nurtured over 150 years and not surprisingly, as far as the profession is concerned, it is graven in stone. However, reform was initiated outside the government fold with the establishment, establishment of INTEC in 1984 and departments of conservation studies in a few academic institutions soon thereafter. INTEC undertook several urban conservation studies for historic towns. These studies taught to reverse the gaze of the professional by first considering historic settlements as heritage, 
and second, by formulating context specific solutions to their problems. The approach to dealing with the problems of historic settlements is largely based on the lessons of Atlas Geddes, but extended to address contemporary imperatives of an aspirational and developing society. Thus, the legacy of Geddes has not been entirely forgotten, but it is a work in progress. What we have learned over the last three decades, however, in, in undertaking conservation projects is that the, that the object of erasing this idea is graven in stone is purely contested by the profession and civic authorities. I will conclude my uh, this short presentation by showing a few slides. Now, can we see some of these slides? I've taken the examples of a few intact studies to show how one looks at the uh, 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 how one looks at historic settlements with uh, you know diagnostic surveys and conservative surgery. This is the town of Chanderi. We, I did this in, in 1985, and it's a small settlement, historic, sari weaving, and it was in the process of being re uh, redeveloped because a dam had come back, come nearby, and they were going to be resettling the population, and this town was going to be transformed. So we undertook the study to see street, street by street, house by house, to understand how it could be improved and how it could be uh, accommodate the new population. New housing was all also suggested incorporating the old technologies that were already prevalent. Next. Another example is Varanasi. In Varanasi, again, one knows about Varanasi, but in uh, 1986, the Varanasi Development Authority had applied to the World Bank for making, tour, making Varanasi tourist friendly. And, they had, and the, this suggestion from, from the World Bank planners was to make a riverside boulevard along Varanasi. When we heard this, we were alarmed. And so we pitched in and said, look, this has to be stopped and we can try and solve your problems by looking at the city quite differently. So once again, the city was looked at differently. We, for example, the first photograph shows this Panchkroshi Yatra, which goes along the river also, which they wanted to convert into a riverside boulevard. And we showed that how carefully it could be blended in with the city and this Panchkroshi Yatra could in fact be constructed uh, without disturbing the city. And the other problems of the city could also be resolved by looking at it in a much more sympathetic way. Next. So there's some examples of neighborhoods of Varanasi which we said that could be uh, improved, the problems could be looked at. So again, as you see, it is diagnostic survey and conservative surgery looking at this city very carefully. Now this goes on. Next. And I'll just give an example of even uh, education institution, SPA. SPA also studied Varanasi, other institutions have studied it. So there is a culture of, of uh, furthering uh, Geddes ideas in the academy at least and in a very practical way because these are all practical problems of Varanasi or Chanderi or Ujjain or all these uh, over 50 such towns were studied. So these are there on the records. But the next I'll show you is what actually happens in the field. This is the, Vish the famous Vishwanath Dham project of Prime Minister Modi in Bar Varanasi. Now, an architect is employed and the architect looks at it and says, my God, this is a mess. This is a maze. And if I have to do something, I could erase part of it and, and link the Vishwanath temple to the river. So he, and this, part shown in color is all the areas that are erased to make this plaza and boulevard to the river. Next. So you can see in the first, the area that is being marked. And in the second, you can see the area that has been outlined, which is all going to be erased. It's all going to be wiped out and redone. Next. And finally, it will become uh, 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 this what they consider a beautiful plaza, but nothing to do with Varanasi. It could be anywhere else. It could be any modern city. It could be anywhere else. They could have done these solutions. So while the academy suggests something, the, the uh, architect planner is doing something else. Next. And so this is a, a, a aerial view of the development. All the area that is the 
fabric of the city has been destroyed and new fabric has been laid with, without any context of what the city is. Next. And to achieve this, you can see the kind of destruction that's going on. This is the Vishwanath temple and all the areas around it are being demolished, have been demolished. Next. Other parts just being demolished. So, you know, where is the diagnostic survey? Where is the conservative surgery as far as the profession is concerned? But this is what is happening in the a prime area in Varanasi. Next. To give an idea of the kind of demolition that takes place, how the old fabric is uh, removed to and the new one is introduced. Next. So more shots of all, all this uh, destruction that's taking place to construct the new redevelopment project. And much of this redevelopment project goes on not only in Varanasi, in other places also. And today we are talking about the Central Vista and like the Central Vista, many other parts of the town, a similar kind of redevelopment takes place. Next. I'm just giving you one example of Chandni Chowk, Chandni Chowk, the historic uh, Chandni Chowk, which is being beautified. And lo and behold, the toilet's right in the middle of Chandni Chowk. So this is the sensitivity that architects and planners have towards the historic neighborhood. And we're not talking about any historic neighborhood. We're talking about Chandni Chowk, the central vista of uh, Shah Jahanabad, where eight such toilets are going to be placed in the central verge. And it took us, we had to go to court to stop it. The toilets have been stopped, but I uh, think the transformers are still there. So that's really my presentation to say that, you know, the ideas of Gettys are very much alive. They are being worked out, but it's a work in progress. And what one has to contest is the profession and the kind of contestation I've shown you, whether it's Varanasi or whether it is Chandni Chowk or Central Vista, this contestation continues. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Pogi. Uh, I'm going to improvise a bit and I'm going to weave my questions that would stimulate the moderated discussion with some questions that have been coming in from our audience. Uh, but I think I'll first start with a question of mine, which perhaps I'll pose to Narayani Gupta. And uh, I'd like to cite Lewis Mumford in, in his, uh, the foreword he wrote to, to the book, uh, Patrick Ellis in India. And he said, few foreign observers have shown more sympathy, for instance, with the religious and social practices of the Hindus than Gedi's did. Yet no one could have written more scathingly of Mahatma Gandhi's attempt to conserve the past by reverting to the spinning wheel at a moment when the fundamental poverty of the masses in India called for the most resourceful application of the machine, both to agricultural and industrial life. So there seems to be a balancing act of balancing tradition and modernity. And could you uh, comment on that? Um, uh, thank you. Yes, I, at first glance, it could sound as though it's traditional modernity. It's not that. I think, um, I hope I'm not putting my words in instead of Geddes, but I suspect that when he admires things which he calls Hindu, He's looking at the larger civilizational aspect of it, whereas what he found Gandhiji doing seemed to him to be gimmicky. That is, he picked up something and uh, made it a symbol to whatever, whatever, just as with the Dandi march, he uh, uses the metaphor of <clears throat> salt. So I don't see any contradiction. I mean, it's the kind of thing that many of us would do, surely, that we would accept uh, something which is much larger, which has developed in many directions over centuries, and and some uh, another thing which, at this point of time, sort of telling people all to spin vigorously and uh, the, everything will write itself, seems to be just a gimmick that um, sounds anti-British, anti-modern. I mean can take up his whole notion of Hind Swaraj also, which could appear, uh, uh, that could seem to be something that um, doesn't fit in with the current system. So I, I don't see any contradiction in it. No? But Prem, if I might interject here. Prem, yeah. 
if yes, I might yes. go ahead. Answer, in answer to that question, you know, if you look at the field, the kind of urban conservation projects we are doing, very much following what Geddes was saying, and yet modernizing historic cities. It is not as though that one wants to keep uh, heritage as frozen in the in the past, which Mumford seems to be suggesting. But I think Geddes is also talking about transforming cities, but in a sympathetic way. I think so. That's the key to understanding the uh, the message of Geddes that nothing is being kept, nothing being preserved. We're developing, transforming, but in a sympathetic way, not importing solutions from elsewhere and <laughs> transplanting them. But as they say, indigenous modernity. You know, that's the new latest term now. We talk about modernity that is Western, and we are now talking about modernity that 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 is indigenous. So can we invent okay. an indigenous modernity? Okay, I, th I think that leads to the next question, in fact, which is, it says addressed to Mr. Menon, uh, where Simon Varghis asks, what is the criteria to divide historic settlements to old and new? And uh, let me throw in along with this uh, question, what Geddes has to say in his book, uh, Cities in Evolution, where he has a chapter called the spirit of a city, saying every city has a spirit. And he says, we have to realize and keep in view the spirit and individuality of our city, its personality and character, and to enhance and express this, if we would not further efface or repress it. So, so, he's, so there isn't really a division, right, between historic and new uh, in such a sort of uh, stark no, way. Not at all. No, not at all. That's exactly the point I was trying to make. One of the R... Uh, uh, rather uh, formulae is we must have development oriented conservation not preservation oriented conservation but development oriented so the history has to continue but history, history cannot be erased history has to be accommodated has to be developed so this is some term that we try and use in urban conservation that uh, conservation has to be development oriented we cannot remain static, we cannot remain unchanging, we have to change. But how we change is the issue. And right now what I showed in Varanasi or, you know, or in Chandni Chowk is changing without any understanding of what the historic spirit is. Okay, thanks. Uh, now le let me direct a question to Partho, who uh, mentioned that uh, Geddes didn't have, have much to say about the big metropolis, which is why people are disappointed in him. But we have to remember, as uh, D.S. Rao has pointed out in his comment, uh, that Geddes is the person who coined the word conurbation. So, so perhaps he saw the big city not as a unitary city, but as a conglomeration of individual neighborhoods, uh, which is a different approach from, from the way that we take today. Uh, what, what is your thought on that? Well, I, actually, I, maybe I didn't make myself clear. I was actually saying exactly the opposite, which is that he did think about the big city and his Barabaza report is a very good example of how he had to confront uh, both capital and labor. You know, the two big issues for, uh, for a larger industrialized metropolis, right? So all I was pointing out was that the tendency is to, people feel disappointed with Geddes because these are issues. So for instance, I mean, if you look at the histories of uh, urban planning, what do we really study? I mean, we study uh, Robert Caro's New York, we study, you know, London, we study Berlin, um, you know, uh, you know, yes, Paris, of course, Hausmann, Paris. Geddes has no place even in the, you know, you would think that a do-gooding uh, white man who came to India and did good things, he would find a place in the Western uh, histories of urban planning, he doesn't, because he's not seen as somebody who addresses these issues. Uh, uh, I'm saying actually he did. Uh, his Bada Baza report is a very, very good example. There are many other things in the report. I mean, I, obviously there's no time to go into it. Uh, for instance, he confronts the issues of land and uh, land ownership and so on and so forth. But um, so he was thinking all along, uh, along uh, but his reputation seems to have come from the fact of the smaller projects that he did. So I think we need to revise our views on Gettys. That's what I was saying. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, let, me, let me throw open a question which any of you three can take up whoever wishes to. But uh, I think two years after Geddes died, uh, Nehru writes a letter to his daughter 
remembering Geddes and praising him and hailing him as an important figure and focusing on something that Geddes had to say about education, which he said should be based on heart, hand, and head. And Nero says it was not the three R's, it was the three H's, and, and he put those in that order, heart, hand, and head. Uh, yet we seem to have gone away from that. Even Nehru seems to have gone away from that in later years where we just talk about head and, uh, and sort of almost forget about both heart and hand. Uh, how, how do we, um, I mean, what are your thoughts on that and what kind of discussion within academia and the profession should we bring in to sort of recover? Because I get the sense this is something really important also that Gedi said. Can I just, I was just wondering sure. whether <clears throat> Nehru got his, I was thinking at that time of Zakir Hussain, Sunait Ali, because that was very uh, highly discussed at that point in time. And I have read uh, accounts of Europeans who came here and were involved in adult education and in the Nait Ali projects. And this had got off to a very good start I know because uh, the university I was at in Jamia, they had, uh, the school was based, it was a university which started with kindergarten and went up to a PhD. And the children's education was very much involved with the philosophy of Naitali. Somehow it seems to have disappeared along the way. And I think that is worth thinking about. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, let me raise another question, and I think this uh, perhaps both Pato and uh, Ogi can weigh in on. And uh, this, in a way, ties into Pato's comments that uh, Geddes was also was very not just of the state, but also of architects and planners. And uh, this comes from Philip Boardman's biography on Geddes, where there's a, a, a chapter, a story he tells of Geddes, which is titled Maharaja for a Day and about how Gedi's uh, deals with the, the plague in Indore. And he involves the citizenry in that. Uh, he says the Diwali procession, the route will be chosen by which houses are the cleanest, which streets are the cleanest. And he, he backs that with a free garbage clearance service. And uh, in, in the procession, the final procession, he celebrates the sweepers of Indore. And Gedi's personally steps into the procession to greet them. And the mayor of Indore says to uh, Geddes, uh, that's uh, great that you could do that because he said, I can't do that as a Brahmin, I can't go and meet an untouchable, but you as a European are free to do so. And have, have we actually created this, this kind of a you know, sustained, you know, we are still like the mayor of Indore. We, we maintain these caste and class barriers where we feel planners cannot engage with cities. That's like getting, becoming pure, becoming dirty or somewhere. Has, has, has that attitude uh, still, you know, still contaminated plan? No, I think in India, we have huge problems to overcome. And as an example, I'll say that there's a post-COVID discussion what the future city should be. And by and large, people are saying it should be dense, efficient transport, better technology, you know, digital technologies. You know, that, that is the direction of the thinking. The humanism part of it is gone, and yet the tragedy was human. You, the, the, the tragedy of Indian cities was the inhumanity of it. So if it's going to be any lesson that we learned from this COVID experience and what we had to do about a future city would have to be about values, about human beings. And you're quite right. I think that we as a, a society are so overwhelmed by these, uh, this uh, distinction between us and them that we cannot have an inclusive city. We find it difficult to imagine an inclusive city. We can always keep them aside somewhere else, but it will not be an inclusive city. Like Geddes was thinking about, about Bada Bazaar, that you know, how everyone has to, one is dependent on the other, the rich are dependent on the poor, poor are dependent on the rich. So you know, you got to have a city where, uh, as he called inclusive housing, uh, as in a, a mixed land, mixed housing. So these kind of ideas will take much more time to to uh, fructify. 
Patho, okay. you have anything? I have, I have said a couple of things to say. Uh, these are from the biographies that I've read, uh, and uh, particularly the biography of Professor Helen Meller, which is there, um, which is a very important book, I think. Uh, so a couple of things. He did think about caste all the time, and uh, certainly about untouchability, not quite in the way that we think now, obviously. I mean, he, he, so one of the things that we know which happens with modern technological intervention in the city is that there is deindustrialization, that people lose their work. So Geddes was very aware of this. So if you have, for instance, in 19th century middle, I mean, from my, since I've worked on Calcutta, when the modern piping, pipe, uh, the, the, the water for, uh, uh, system was in, actually introduced and the flushing system was introduced, it meant that the bhistis lost their jobs. Right. So what do you do? I mean, on the one hand, you have this and then the other, the whole group of people lose their work. So Geddes was very aware. If you look at his indoor report, uh, he knew that this was this was happening and something needed to be done. So therefore, he thought about transforming some of these uh, uh, communities whom we, whom we saw rightly as artisanal communities into something else. So for instance, to, these may sound harebrained schemes, but for instance, in indoor, he talked about the suburbs where there would be sewage farms. And he said, instead of sweepers, now these sweepers would become gardeners. They would tend to these farms. They would produce fruit. They would be growing vegetables. This would be supplied to the, uh, to this, uh, to the small, uh, to the suburb or to the city. So there he was very, very much uh, aware of this. He, uh, uh, quite remarkable actually, uh, unlike any other plan. Uh, you know, and if you look at all modern planning in India, basically what happens is a kind of drastic deindustrialization. People are just thrown out of the city, and that's it. Okay. Uh, actually, we've had a couple of people who have uh, cited Helen Miller. Uh, Narani did earlier, and Patho just did, mm -hmm. and uh, she she is actually part of our audience. So I'm trying to see if we can bring her into the conversation, add her to the panel. It would be nice. Yeah. Uh, but, let, but why, why? Could I just add one point here, which is that yeah. Helen has just been given a lifetime award for the work she has done in urban history, urban uh, writings, uh, not just history, but urban studies generally. And she said that she has a lot to thank Patrick Geddes for. <laughs> Do ask her to join us. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm here. I, I, have you got me? Yes. Yeah. We yes. <laughs> We can't see you. <laughs> ah, wonderful. Can't see me. Oh, uh, we can uh, see you. We can see you, Helen. This is fine. All right. Yeah. And Lucid. Okay. Well, um, my, my, my comment so far, I, I'm afraid I missed the beginning because my machine didn't uh, actually uh, attach to your workshop. But I've been very interested in all the presentations. And um, there are two big points that I'd like to say. I agree with many, many of the, oh, well, most of the comments, but the, the thing is that we want Patrick Geddes to inform us now. And he actually um, was a man of the 19th century. And he was a, a, a disciple of Herbert Spencer and he thought about evolution. And so when he thought about changing a city from the past to the present, he was, he didn't think about the buildings so much as the people, which is why he didn't write about architecture in his plans. And that last uh, comment about um, sending the sweepers to be gardeners, this was really the absolute essence of, of how he wanted change to happen, to, to, to actually keep not, you can't reform everything, you can't clean everything, you can't, that awful, um, plans for knocking down uh, what's it called an essay I can't remember which plan it was that I that uh, we, sh we just looked at that idea of blotting out a whole um, built environment simply because it doesn't fit was totally against his uh, his understanding of how the environment actually helps to build societies and people and you can't do that quickly. You have to do it over a long period of time. And um, which isn't very helpful for <laughs> if, you're, if you are actually dealing with modern problems right now. Anyway, um, so um, 
I'm also interested in the idea that, that well, I, I was very struck by the idea that when, um, I've forgotten who said it, uh, the idea that the tragedy of COVID is humanity. And actually, I mean, this is such a big, this is global, <laughs> not, and by the way, I don't think, oh, that reminds me, Geddes never said, think global, act local. That has been a myth because we've never found the, the comment in any, any no, not the Geddes family, not all the reports, not anything, but it is true that that was his attitude. And I feel that, um, that if we can, use his legacy to create a more humanistic understanding of societies and communities. He didn't do a big metropolis, but of course his metropolis was Edinburgh. And Edinburgh, not in, even in his own century of the 19th century, but Edinburgh in the 18th century, when the university was absolutely amazing and all that kind of thing. And uh, so he, he, when he saw, uh, um, if we could look at some of those things as historical pointers, but we can't interpret them, I believe, totally in, in, in a modern context. It's just a legacy of ideas that are useful. And I feel I need to say that very firmly because um, Noah Rubin uh, that was also mentioned has been, is a very literal minded scholar. She's a great scholar but she, um, she has looked for the principles of Geddes, the, the, the knowledge, the, the way, to, way to achieve things is to have theory and to have structure and to have um, modern technology. And she thinks that everything he wrote is all nonsensical because he was a dreamer. But I have a great, great hope that just now we are globally, uh, beginning to think in terms of the need for a different approach, for concern for humanity, for a spiritual attitude to people's uh, futures and that and cities. So if I could say, I think the moment now is about the best one that has been in my lifetime to think about Geddes' ideas and to reinterpret them, then that's what I should like to say. Yeah, thank you. Uh, would would you say that uh, Geddes finds a certain echo in uh, many many years later in Jane Jacobs, who's another neglected figure in mm. urban planning, when she says that uh, cities are are complex self-organizing systems that organize through uh, inhabitation at a pedestrian scale. It's uh, and that. I, I'm I'm actually just working. My latest pr uh, project is on women and the built environment. And um, there's a big theory that women understand almost naturally about the needs of people within cities by, because they have to deal with them, with children, with, 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 with the practical side of things. And if anybody had practical views, it was Geddes. But he, um, Jane Jacobs had her sights much more firmly on Robert Moses and his complete intensity of just destroying the city because he wanted his roads, he wanted to make his thing, and he was so powerful, nobody could stop him. And so, I, I, I mean, I'm a tremendous admirer of what she achieved. <laughs> So perhaps the Jane Jacobs versus uh, Robert Moses is being lived out in India today in the debates over Central Vista. Yes, that's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, if I, I can um, um, raise one issue that uh, on Geddes, his emphasis on civics. In fact, the position he held at Bombay University, he said uh, sociology and civics in his writings on the education of the planner um, in cities and evolution, he talks about the need to tie our town planning and civics. And I looked up the dictionary definition of civics, which says it's the privileges and obligations of citizenship, the study of the privileges and obligations of citizenship. So, so there's this whole idea of citizenship, uh, which is brought into the center, the, rec the recognition of citizenship. 
Um, I would but, I, uh, I, I, really, really, really important. Um, social citizenship. Um, I have actually written another paper recently on Geddes and social citizenship, because um, the early, if you think about the improvement societies and the, go back uh, to um, time, they, they of course also pushed roads through slums and, and that kind of thing. But the people who did it on a voluntary basis in Britain were um, very religious. They called it a social gospel. It was the moral position. The moral position was that you should care for the poor and you cared for them by throwing them out of their houses and building perhaps on the periphery, but with no concern about their, the quality of their life. And Geddes came along and said, that's crazy. We, need, we do need to have citizenship, which uh, creates uh, uh, environments that evolve to, to meet human needs as they are manifest and actually to encourage better societies. And it's a very uh, difficult thing to, to write about because it's, it's very idealistic in many ways, although his methods were always very practical. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn back to some questions from the audience and uh, I'll direct this question to Partho Datta since uh, it has come from someone who I know he has advised on his work. Uh, Sujan Mukherjee says that one of the ideas I love most in Geddes is the preservation of the social soul. This idea of the social soul with, with, that uh, he asked, we, do we need to bring this into the central part of our learning institutional and otherwise to make a more grounded sense of identity rooted in social history? You were addressing that to me? No, to Pato. Oh, <laughs> Pato that. I think Professor Mellon, Mellon would know this much more. I, actually, I don't know that much about this. <laughs> I wouldn't, you do it, you do it. <laughs> I really don't know much about this. I, 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 I'm a bit skeptical of, of these uh, ideas because, you know, what do we mean by the social soul really? I mean, from what I gather from the little that I've read of Geddes and the Geddesian papers and so on and so forth, that he was uh, one of the things that he, I mean, I'm just talking about intellectual history actually here, but is that when he came to India, one thing that he was very struck by was the intellectual vibrancy of the Indian nationalists. And uh, what he therefore saw, uh, it was that it would be an answer to the kind of materialism of the West. And he really hoped that Indian nationalism would be a kind of answer. So he had a lot of hopes uh, from Tagore and from Ananda Kumara Swami and so on and so forth. All these people he was very good friends with. And he was a little dismissive of Gandhi. I feel there was some kind of competition there. He found, I, I forgot in the quote uh, where it is probably, it's probably in Professor Mellon's, Mellon's book, but he actually found Gandhi's ideas derivative. He says, what is this Gandhi? He just takes things from Ga Ruskin, a little bit of Ruskin, a little from this, a little bit of that, and that's all he's doing. But I think there was an element of competition there. Uh, but the sad thing, uh, what happened is, and Professor Gupta, Narani Gupta pointed out that his ideas of urbanism and citizenship did not resonate with Indian intellectuals. They were very good friends of his, but they actually didn't do it. So this, this notion of social soul that if you probably wanted to develop, I mean, I don't know, Sujan probably knows about this. He's worked on, uh, on this also. It just doesn't develop. And what we find instead, and which is a, real, which is a little alarming, is that uh, the Indian nationalists start admiring the work of the British planners, particularly the Calcutta Improvement Trust. So Vipin Chandra Pal, for instance, this great ex quote unquote extremist nationalist, uh, huge critic of the of British rule, has actually written, uh, you know, praising the work of the house humanization of Calcutta. He says, this is what we want Calcutta to be. We want Calcutta to be the second Paris and so on and so forth. So uh, in the end, I think, you know, Geddes' ideas just didn't resonate, just didn't resonate. So uh, I don't know that this doesn't answer the question of social soul, but this is what I know. So I'm just sharing it. It might uh, tie up with uh, 
argument that someone like Michael Walzer says that in liberation movements, and India is one of those that he studies, uh, the leaders of those movements, who are many of whom received education overseas, have trouble dealing with the consciousness of the masses because they don't know how they acquiesce to this, you know, two centuries of uh, colonialism and therefore feel liberation comes from something outside, a greater idea than rather than a direct engagement with the masses. And uh, perhaps that is the split that uh, Geddes saw because he was someone whose whole methodology was based on, you know, just stepping into the place and, and touching it with your heart and hand also. I mean, as, as Lewis Bumford uh, writes also in his forward, there are two sides to get this. One is his sort of very rigorous analytical side, and the other is, a, is an equally strong intuitive and empathetic side, which doesn't allow him distance from what he's studying. So, uh, we, we have a very architectural question, so I guess I should direct that to uh, A.G.K. Menon. Uh, Rowan Erz asks if we see any overlap between Geddy's idea of identity and Kenneth Frampton's idea of critical regionalism. Uh, there is an affinity, but one has to be very careful to define that affinity. The affinity is that, yes, you root it somewhere, and uh, both Frampton and Geddes would root it on what exists, the context. So both are really talking about context-specific development. But uh, of course, get, uh, uh, remember that Frampton is really talking about, talking about modernism uh, and I, I, uh, derivative of modernism is critical regionalism. Whereas uh, uh, Geddes' idea of uh, rooting it in uh, tradition and, or rooting it in the context is not to do with modernism, but welfare and uh, to do with uh, you know, what's good for the society. But the affinity is there. But would, would you say a difference is that uh, Frampton's uh, descriptions of architecture are more abstract, the idea of engaging a citizenry in the, in the life of what his architecture is, is, is not there, whereas it's very much a part of Gettys' uh, thinking. No, let me also again paraphrase a bit that affinity bit as far as Frampton is concerned, if you interpret what he says, you have to in involve the people. Because how do you, you know, how do you have an Indian architecture, Indian modern architecture? You know, you you got to involve what uh, what uh, India is and what Indian architecture is. So there is that uh, uh, link there, but he didn't talk about it explicitly. But let's be very clear: Frampton talk about modernism, a derivative of modernism, and he sees these whether it is uh, India or Mexico or Brazil or wherever it is, it's all variation of a very European idea of modernism. And let's understand modernism is also, you know, modernism begins where history ends. I mean, that is one way of looking at modernism. So, you know, I'd be very careful to, to sort of link the two, but yes, the affinity is there. Um, another question, um, what, uh, while Geddes' work in India, a large percentage of it was uh, commissioned by the princely states. And the princes and the Maharajas are not necessarily who we would turn to look at models of democracy, mod modernity, um, so there, there seems to be some kind of a contradiction there. How, how, how did Geddes uh, deal with that? Narayani? Uh, I'm just thinking, I don't know what Geddes dealing with it, but we must remember that the first town plan, um, which was done uh, with this tremendous sense of responsibility was, for the whole city was in Hyderabad in 1908 after the great flood. So the Nizam is one of your Indian princes. He had an extremely enlightened government. Mirza Ismail was a very good uh, administrator. Mirza Ismail goes on to Jaipur and Jaipur is also benefits from him being there. Um, Baroda, Travancore, I mean, 
most of the princes, if you read Sydney and Beatrice Webb, who traveled in India just two years before Geddes arrived, <laughs> they had nothing but praise for the Indian princes as contrasted to the British cities in their presidencies. So at, uh, I certainly think that they were models of good governance. If you look at the way towns were laid out and um, public facilities provided and so on. And we mustn't just automatically just dismiss them as uh, being conservative or whatever. Okay, uh, we have a question from Gayatri Chandramolishwara, where she says, I've always wondered if Indian cities weren't meant to be cities, a place bound by law, which is fundamentally a European concept to begin with. As a society, we tend to function far better in smaller social clusters. I wonder if this is the fundamental mismatch between how we approach the city and the way it exists and evolves in reality. No, I think it's open to a perceptive comment, very perceptive comment that uh, are we, you know, for example, the Mohalla, we still live in a Mohalla, whether it is in Delhi or uh, you know, modern city, we still, as they say, the mind, the village of the mind, if not the village, physical village, but even as, you know, as so socially, we are just uh, a group of individuals. So it's hard to define the European city, because, you know, the history of European cities would be quite different from the history of Indian cities. So the two are quite different, but we are talking about today, we have a city today, uh, is it like Europe? Of course, it's not like Europe. It's more like an Indian uh, traditional city. We are much more a, a group of mohallas. You know, we call it Green Park and Defence Colony and all that. But uh, we become uh, 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 we are, our mindset is still at that scale. Okay. We have a question from Shantikam Hazarika who notes that Pakistan seems to have given him recognition in Lahore city. Uh, is it possible to elaborate whether he was accommodated in new town planning in Lahore? Which okay. raises the wider question since he was working in undivided India, uh, uh, whether uh, is, is his recognition different in Pakistan compared to India? I can answer to that. Yeah. Can I answer that? Yeah, please, please, please do. Well, Say something about it because in Lahore he was um, he took his exhibition and the one way in which Geddes actually tried to involve the people was not to go to the government but to uh, use local government premises to um, put his exhibition there and to invite everybody to come and of course it was the educated and upper classes that came but he they were very very interested in his work and he came three times. And over this period of time, then in Lahore, they developed uh, new schools, they worked on neighborhoods, they had plans, for small plans and bigger plans. And it was uh, a really um, very good interplay between his ideas and the people and the city. And it was about the only one that really worked like that. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what I like to say. Okay, thanks, Ellen. Well, we are reaching the end of our time. So let me put one last question, which I'll ask each of our panelists and you too, Helen, to uh, give a brief response on. Um, and this is actually a question Narani raised when we had a discussion to plan this evening. And she said, we tend to have occasions like this discussion where we unpack Gettys, we take him out of the cupboard and we bring him into view. And then we pack, we pack him away again and we sort of forget about him. Uh, how do we make sure that he's not packed away again? I mean, Helen, you, you mentioned that this is perhaps the most opportune time to, to, to think of that kind of question. So I'll ask each of our panelists to uh, uh, sort of share their thoughts on it. We can start with you, Helen. Well, if it's me first, um, I, I belong to the International Planning History Society. And um, so I meet people from all over the world. Well, I have done regularly. And they are beginning, more of them, 
well, not all of them, of course, but quite a lot of them want to find a new way of looking at the future, which is um, geared, we, we, we're, we're living through this revolution, a technological revolution. We, we, we're hating the motor car. We're thinking about the climate change. We've got so many things to think about. And they're looking for some kind of way of um, putting these thoughts and <laughs> into practice. So I think that we are at this very moment um, really, really having to think very hard about how we are going to, to, to go on in the future. And in that context, Gettys' ideas should be brought out, taught, told about, not as a, not as a model, because he is obviously a man of the 19th and early 20th century, but as a beginning of a way for us to work our way out um, you know, to think of what is going to be our society of the future. If I might say, you know, the challenge as a practitioner is that we still don't know the answers, but we know, know the pro process. So the process will, will lead us to the answers. So to answer about what the future city is going to be, it's difficult for me to say, well, this is what the future city is going to be. Uh, that requires imagination, that requires you know, uh, 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 things that are out of context. So I would still say that I go by a very natural idea that I must have a value and the value must be following a process. And with that process, I'll come to the form. So the form of the city will really emerge if I follow a process that respects the value. So we know a city must be humane hum and humanistic. We must be inclusive. So those values have to be developed as a process. And then, you know, from that, an idea of a city comes. But I sort of not try and say, well, the future city will be this. I, one cannot predict it now that the question of this new urbanism is something that we've still got to. The language has to be worked out, the grammar has to be worked out, and the form will come out only after that. Could I just quickly put in a couple of points, which is that I'd like to begin at the other end, which is to think of schools and colleges, because an average school child at the end of whatever, class 12, hasn't the faintest idea of architecture, knows nothing about how towns are built, how they grow or are created. They have no sense of it, whatever. So it should be very easy for schools of architecture, perhaps, to get down to preparing workbooks or uh, involve creating a kind of program by which people, at least those, I'm not saying only those living in towns, but everywhere as part of the curriculum should become familiar with their habitat. And there's a whole lot of things we can build in. Environment is a subject which is taught in schools, but environment without a context doesn't get very far. Okay, thank you. Parso? Yeah, I would just say that I would be interested uh, as a historian to have more connected histories of our Indian uh, uh, settlements and uh, towns and cities. Uh, and the way was shown forward by Geddes because his, his, uh, his uh, reports are a kind of ethnographies, you know, and the way he, he sort of uh, focused on, let's say, everyday spaces, for instance, or water bodies, or, or uh, you know, uh, wooded areas, or graveyards, or, you know, the places within the city. If you could do a connected history, then things will become uh, much more uh, we'll be able to take pr pride in, you know, the long urban traditions of uh, of India. But now what happens is that we that Gettys is like a blip and we just press on that icon. We feel very happy when we read about him and then we just forget about it. It becomes another long history of Indian modernism or how India connected to uh, the modernist uh, ideologies of the West. Uh, I think we need another kind of history. I would really, really love to if somebody could do that. Okay, thank you all. That's uh, been a fascinating discussion. And I'd like to thank all our panelists, uh, Narayani Gupta, A.G.K. Menon, Patso Dutta, and Helen Meller, who got drafted into the process <laughs> midway and sportingly joined us. So uh, thank you all. And... Uh, 
let's all apply our minds to the future and how we can continue this, what we discussed today and, and keep the ideas of Patrick Geddes alive, building on it, using it just as a starting point, recognizing as Helen pointed out that he was a man of the 19th century, uh, early 20th. But, uh, so thank you all for being there. We've had a very, very high participation in this event and we will have more such events in the future. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.